So um, I'm going to begin, and I, you know, when I first was asked to come to the panel and talk, I was kind of surprised. Um, because I have a re relationship with my community that's complicated. I think we all know, we all know what that means, right? So, <laughs> um, and so at the same time, I called and talked to uh, mentors and friends, and they said this is a great opportunity for you to do what you do best. And like at the university and here, I'm sure that I'm broad because I provide a certain amount of diversity, which I'm sure is very obvious what the diversity is. Um, but so in that way, I thought that I would use my work to talk about uh, who I am because I have focused my work. There was a particular time um, after going to college and getting my master's that I really decided that I would focus my work on this in-between space that I occupied um, as a Cuban-American, uh, first uh, gener second generation, um, and what that meant to be in between. And if, um, it's interesting because I say, how, do you, how can you do that? How do you focus your work? How can you make it be so specific? And what I did was I decided to eliminate all color from my work. So therefore, in a way, I removed that aspect of being Hispanic and colorful from my work and really decided to really think about who I was and where I came from and what that meant. And so, okay, let's see if this works. Did I do right? Um, <laughs> so this is uh, my, my first experience and the best way to describe myself is when I call someone up on the phone and I begin a conversation, I say, my name is Juana Valdez. I know automatically that I get someone who imagines me as a white person. You know, and then when I walk in the room, there's, there's a moment, it's sort of like, oh, are you Cuban? And I'm like, yeah. And then they're like, oh, you don't sound Cuban. And <laughs> when I was younger, I, I used to sort of press them in terms of what does a Cuban sound like? And so give me those specific of what does it meant? And I think they were talking about a stereotype and a representation of what they thought a Cuban should be. Um, and the same with the thing, you don't look Cuban. And what they meant is, and I really kind of finalized that, I spent five years in Miami teaching now. It was it, uh, my hair wasn't straight and I didn't have high heels. I wasn't, you know, sort of voluptuously out there in the world and all these things, you know. <laughs> uh, and and so, I, so I kind of began to negotiate this dynamic of who I am, what I sound like, who I am not. And the most impression that when I walk into the room before I open my mouth, all you see is a black woman. You know, where she comes from, what she does, who she does, it's kind of uh, uh, a, hidden, uh, a hidden aspect of that. And so with that, I am showing you one of my first pieces, which is actually, it's a series, is a pair of chancleta. Uh, the text in the back is by Renaldo Arenas. And so I went back to l my inheritance, which is uh, Cecilia Valdez. And for all of you who know who Cecilia Valdez is, the novel by Cerillo Villaverdez, which is actually published in Cuba. Um, actually, it's first published in Cuba. The last uh, final publication of it happens in New York um, in 1882. Um, and it talks about the miscegenation that's taking place in Cuba and so forth. But the text that you're actually looking at is a text from Reynaldo Arenas. Uh, La Loma del Angel in 1987, most well known as Angel Hill. Um, for me, and where I begin to talk about this in-between space is that for me with the sandal, not only did I evoke what I believe to be the Cinderella story, but also the red slippers uh, that bring you back home. Um, in the novel, in the section that I talk about, is describes Cecilia having these sandals that click and clock themselves to the streets of Havana, being able to move about in this certain uh, amount of freedom as a hybrid of identity that is not necessarily black, but not necessarily white, and has the ability to move about and, and be, you know, uh, sustained or supported in some way, and nobody knows how, but other than the fact that there must be some Spanish money sustaining the, uh, her ability to exist in the world. Um, what's important for me is the fact, again, we're talking almost three generations of Cubans who have actually existing and making art and being outside of Cuba, talking about Cuba and talking about the identity of being Cuba. Uh, and I include, um, sorry, uh, Reynaldo Arenas in that. And so for me, it was really essential to sort of track this sort of experience that wasn't exceptionally uniquely mine. 
Um, but it's something that has been there and it has existed and it continues to exist, especially in the Caribbean and in Latin America, if we don't acknowledge this history of imperialism and colonialism uh, and, and, and politics that has kind of uh, created the situation that we exist in. Um, the next image that you're seeing is actually a series of paper boats that I made while sitting in Havana and Malecon. Um, thinking about this idea, and again, I'm using the same, the pages from the actual book to fabricate this image that allows you to escape in the idea of escaping through literature, through um, through the world, a, a situation that is impossible to escape. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> We will keep moving really quickly. So I came back here because I thought it was really important for me also. The other thing, the two most important thing that I want to say is to talk about the X factor and the Latin, uh, Latinx. Uh, uh, and I thought, what did that mean for me? And I think most important, I think, is to talk about the fact that we are not one monolithic identity. Um, as a Cuban, I mean, there's a Cuban in the island, a Cuban off the island, what does that mean? Uh, there is a combination of mestizo uh, within hidden me. There's an aspect of Chinese as well that is invisible, but is there within the upbringing and the dynamics of how you exist in the world. Um, I do believe, again, that part of the situation that needs to be sustained is how to maintain our differences while still sustaining um, who we are as, as a people from a geographical location that may not necessarily be all in one place and be coming out of island. Um, again, one of the main things I address through my book, through my work, is the idea of pigmentocracy, which I think is an issue in terms of colorism, which is not only just based in the United States, but it also impacts tremendously within the Caribbean and also in Latin America. And last but not least, what gives me the the ability to talk about being black in America and a black the black experience in America, uh, which is also something that I totally feel that I own, even if I still hold on to the being Cuban and core Latina and so forth, that as an artist, as an individual, I don't get up feeling more black or feeling more Hispanic or feeling more Cuban. Like this isn't, <laughs> the separation just doesn't happen. I get up in the morning and I'm either really gumpy or hungry. <laughs> Um, or I'm thinking about how do I go out in the world and challenge people uh, to accept me and as I am and who I am and what I stand for. Thank you.